Hey everyone, welcome back to the Wealth Preservation Podcast. We are here again with uh, uh, Josh Rodbart. He is joining us from Hong Kong, and then Josh Saunders, uh, my my co-host, who is joining us from Tennessee. So we've got quite the uh, quite the a bit of time distance between the two, but we're all here. Thank uh, thank God for technology, and we're excited to get this episode kicked off. Uh, how, how's Hong, How's Hong Kong? Good, waking up, you know, waking up. It's morning here. It's all uh, all good. Uh, um, yeah, another busy day in the in the urban jungle. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Josh, how's how's nighttime in Tennessee? <laughs> well, I just got done uh, doing the reverse hostage negotiation, uh, putting my kids to bed. So, <laughs> yeah, just stay in there. I'll do anything <laughs> if you'll just go to bed. Please, just go to bed. Yeah. Uh, well, yes. you have, so, you have, that's how it went. You have a really good microphone because I could actually hear you as you were telling him to go to bed. Um, you yeah. Know, and, yeah. And I think I was recording, so um, maybe I'll, I'll I'll have Jay edit that out and send it to you. <laughs> Please just maybe go to se- bed. Please. Maybe send it to me. I'll put it on loudspeaker in my kids' room also. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, well, so so for anyone who uh, was not uh, or who has not listened to our previous episode with Josh Rodbart, uh, go back and listen to it. He has a really incredible story about going from Tel Aviv to uh, you know to the states, back to Tel Aviv, working in Jerusalem, uh, living in a one hundred square foot you know apartment next to a billboard shining light into his face <laughs> uh, in Hong Kong, and getting into the uh, precious metals industry. So. Uh, super interesting episode, but now we're going to talk about the actually stepping into entrepreneurship and all of a sudden becoming, you know, the accountant, the the marketing manager, the HR, everything, um, and what it's like, you know, really as a as a up and coming business, right? Because I mean, you kind of got into a very niche market, and you know, you guys have had to establish yourself. So really excited to get uh, into that. Real quick, do you want to give everyone a two-minute recap of just what uh, uh, the J. Rothbart Company does and uh, where you guys are based out of and, and who, you know, kind of your, your niche market? Right. So, so again, thanks for having me. So, Jared, we, we're a, a bullion house based out of Hong Kong. Uh, we have an, also an office in Singapore, but we really uh, look, at, look at ourselves as a global uh, a one-stop shop for precious metals. So, the, the core business that we do is buying and selling metals uh, uh, bullion bars and coins, uh, uh, gold, silver, platinum, palladium. Our clients are coming from you know sixty g- uh, different jurisdictions, really global. So there's the trading, but as I said, we provide the entire comprehensive solution. So we arrange for secure trans- transportation, and we arrange for secure storage. So clients can, because most of our clients buy uh, bullion and hold it. So we we help them manage the entire thing from buying it from good refiners, uh, transporting it safely, storing it, getting the insurance uh, on it, and so on. We also provide finance using this their bullion as collateral. So if they need money, if they have other investment to do, they can do that. And uh, we have a sister company that helps actually cryptocurrency investors move to the safety of gold by converting they're, they're a Bitcoin or USDT or whatnot to gold in a very, very um, safe uh, environment. Now, our clients, we're not a retail shop. Uh, uh, you know, it, our clients are usually uh, quite wealthy. Uh, the minimum, I would say the minimum kind of, uh, should like the threshold of most clients to work with us is $100,000. Um, but we, we handle anything between Fifty thousand dollars if someone is a, a building a portfolio, all the way up to fifty million dollars if it's a big family that wants to buy a chunk of gold. It's really a, a very global, and we offer uh, services globally. So we have clients that wants to store in Singapore. We have clients that wants to um, pick up gold from Italy. We have clients that we're now handling um, a, a transportation of silver coins to Missouri. Uh, 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 really, we can really. Our capabilities are are quite wide because our backgrounds. I mentioned the previous episode is from the secure logistics industry, mm-hmm. so we know how to move gold, we know how to store gold, and it's all complement the main business of buying and selling metals. Yeah, gotcha. Very cool. Uh, well, well, so I guess to start off because it, it, it's definitely a very interesting concept. I mean, there there are some people who you know at, at risk of you know we we. Uh, 
don't want to go into any you know financials right or, or any uh, uh portfolio um analysis or anything but there are people who you know they'll buy like a gold based etf right or silver based etf and, and you're doing the actual physical assets of it what what are probably some of the biggest misconceptions you run into when people are trying to you know buy gold where you're like eh, it's not really how this industry works um I think the so the misconception, by the way, is that uh, first the misconception that buying gold is as good as buying ETF. That's not, and I can talk about it later. ETF is not the same as buying gold, mm -hmm. but I th people think it's um, it's complicated. Buying physical, people think buying physical is complicated. It uh, it it takes long time. It's expensive. Uh, one of the things we at J Rothbard are very proud at is we do a lot of educational work. We'll do a lot of webinars. It's not. It's not. It's not a market. We don't convince people. We're not investment investment advisors. You know, like like you guys. We want to educate people and and tell them what the difference is. How, why it's easy to buy gold. We want to make it as easy as possible. That's why we pack. We we provide a package of 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 all the services around it. So it's not expensive to buy physical gold. It's not tedious. It's not something that uh, is complicated. And uh, it's not, and and one 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 misconception is is that there is a charge if you look at gold price, you know, in Bloomberg or Reuters or or any other website, you see the price uh, is of gold or silver is per ounce, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know that there's a, there's there's actually a premium to buy the physical product. There's a premium you pay spot plus a fee. And what people don't know, they think the fee is our fee. And, and, and we always tell them we don't pay. We charge, of course, our fee because we do need to make a little bit of money. But the fee, <laughs> we pay the, the fee for the refinery, actually. There's a fee for producing those products. People don't know, for example, American Eagle, right, made by the U.S. Mint. It's a legal tender. So the U.S. Mint pays royalty to, to the federal government on every coin minted. They pay royalty. If you're the Royal Canadian Mint, you pay royalty because it's a legal tender. A, a, a gold maple, I think it's 50 Canadian dollars. They need to pay the government for the right to use it to be a legal tender. So there are real costs associated with, with, with producing the product. So sometimes I tell clients, yeah, it's, we charge whatever. Uh, uh, on, on gold, we charge, let's say, spot price plus 1%. It's like, oh, you're making 1%. It's like, actually, no, because we need to pay the refiners because the refiners are charging us for you know getting the the gold from Africa or from where from wherever to Switzerland, melting it, sending it to Hong Kong, delivering it to our office or to the vault, it's all cost money. You know, it's a real unlike right. finance. Um, I don't want to speak to. Uh, I don't want to badmouth uh, the finance uh, uh, institution. Oh, you, you can you can you bad can. yeah no no no. <laughs> Yeah, but away. unlike yeah. unlike finance, there are we are selling real product which has real cost. You need to ship it. It's not moving papers around and charging the end client a fee. So these are kind of the misconception. <laughs> but having said that, the, the the fees are pretty much on par with 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 what you pay for ETF or any other uh, financial product. So so yeah. I, I tell you, don't be afraid. It's not expensive. It's not complicated. We are here to walk, you know, to take the client's hand by, you know, take the client by the hand, guide them through the process, make it easy, kind of, you know, make him a bit more relaxed about it. it it's because uh, then some people are a bit nervous about it. He is putting a lot of money in. Sometimes, you know, yeah. we have American clients putting gold in in, right. in Hong Kong. For them, it's like they're wiring one million dollar to Hong Kong Bank, and then they're supposed to be gold at the other end, right? <laughs> yeah. So, kind of. Talk me through that trend. Like, this is just, you know, for our listeners, this is very interesting. So let's say, you know, we'll just make up an arbitrary number. We're not recommending anybody invest or do anything like this. But just if someone called call up Rotbar today and they're like, hey, you know, I, I want to buy, uh, you know, a million dollars worth of, of gold, right? I, I want to, you know, I want to custody it in your bullion bank there in Hong Kong. What does that transaction look like for you guys? But then also what actually happens in the background, right? Like what actually happens? You know what balls? You know what? What's the machine look like I, that goes in the background? I, I imagine right, you don't right. have a bunch of people down by the river uh, panning for gold, right? I mean, that's <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. No, Zvika's no, down there. Zvika's here. down there. Zvika's down there with painting. A, with... <laughs> He's painting gold. Better yeah. than painting those, those bricks. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> so so I'll, I'll, so okay. Let's put it this way: from from client facing, right? Client facing yeah. is very simple. Client needs to do it's it's a, kind of a three steps process. Client needs to sign a due diligence, you know, KYC, know your customer form, where they tell us basically who the client is, you know, where they where they live. They give us a a, 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 a copy of passport or ID. Uh, they tell proof of address, a proof of banking. You know, where they're gonna wire the money from. Right. They send it to us. Once we confirm that, and I'll go to the black box of, of what happens here in the office. They wire us, they sign an order form. We send them an order form saying, yeah, $1 million gold in Hong Kong. This, please confirm this is what you want to buy. They make the wire. And from the moment the, the fund hits our, account, hits our account, usually same day or the next day, they will get a storage receipt and photos of their gold bars sitting in the vault in Hong Kong or Singapore or, or New York, wherever they want it. In this invoice, right. they'll see the bar's numbers. You know, they have their own allocated holdings. It's like having a car. So they have their own, own holdings belonging to them with the title. So very simple. KYC form, sending identifying document, make a wire, bang. A day later, you have you get the storage receipt with, with, those, uh, uh, with those bar's numbers and photos and everything. And then you get title in the gold. Now, on, on, on our back end, you know, we have uh, we have a compliance people that needs to that run. Once we get those due diligence documents, we need to make sure the client is a good client. There's no none of them is on a sanction list. None of them is a drug lord. No, uh, uh, no uh, um, a funny business, you know, no uh, scammers, no uh, pedophiles, no dark net uh, uh, and, right. uh, you know, rich people and all that. And once this is confirmed, we start picking up the phone to the different refiners, especially if it's a big transaction. One million dollars is not a small transaction. And we work with all the big uh, uh, recognized global refiners. So what we will do, we'll, it, and it's really send emails and pick up the phone and let them bid on whoever can give us you know, the quickest supply at the best premium, as I mentioned, the, the, the mm -hmm. lowest premium and the short, shortest supply time uh, of this lot and now it's a very dynamic market you know we can call a refinery here they had gold in the morning by noon uh however standard charter just bought one ton of gold so they ran out of gold so i need to go i need right. to call to the other refinery. it's very very old school uh business again because of the if the physical it's all factories it's a refining process maybe they had a supply of gold coming from switzerland or from africa maybe maybe not so maybe they don't have the raw material Maybe the machine is broken. We have a, a refinery now that we wanted 100 gram bars, about $6,000 each. Like, the mold broke. We need to wait for six months until we get a new mold. We don't make this now. We, we, we need to ah. wait. We're making only one kg yeah. bars, you know, one kilogram bar, only $60,000 units. You know, so it's all kind of physical. Right. During COVID, people weren't coming to the factory. It's like, okay, when can I get the gold? Oh, in two weeks. Why? Because we can't get the gold out of Africa to melt it. And we don't have the guys in the factory to uh, 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 cast it, right? So we do those calls uh, by the time the client is, is, is doing the processes. We try to source the gold locally. We don't like to ship gold from one, from one destination to another unless it's necessary. Just because it's another risk and another time, you know, it takes more time. It's another risk, more cost. So let's say Hong Kong, sure. for your example, we'll call the tour refiners here. We'll call pop, uh, um, probably a couple of the big uh, dealers, the big traders, uh, global traders. Do you have stocks in Hong Kong? And then we lock in the price. Now, again, because of our reputation, the time we've been in business, we can lock, you know, $10, $15 million uh, worth of gold, purchase it within a phone call. So we pick up the phone. Yeah. And I had a mm. friend sitting in the office. He was shocked. It's done this way. But like, okay, how much? Okay, we need $1 million. How much is it? What's the spot now? Confirm, confirm. We close the phone. You know, we, we hang up, we prepare the documentation, we pay them from the client's money, we pay them, then we send those big, you know, brings or as I mentioned, Malkami trucks, you know, with the shotguns and everything, we send them to the refinery <laughs> to pick it up, sending it to the vault. The vault people are looking at each gold bar, making sure it's good, there are no bands, no, uh, you know, they, they weigh each and every bar, making sure it's exactly what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to be. And then they pack it, put it on the shelf, and then uh, we can transfer it to the uh, the client. So there's a lot of 
Gotcha. I would say uh, paperwork, legwork to be done. So you see the difference between what the client's seeing, right? And, yeah. and what's yeah. happening Very here different. on the back end, you know? So, <clears throat> so we have a lot of people working and a truck is going and we have the operation uh, uh, people here tracking the truck. Okay, where are you? When it will be delivered? Then the vault guys, okay, are the bars good? Did you look at it? Did you weigh them? Show me the photos. Okay, everything looks good. So when we confirm everything is fine the way then we transfer title and that's way the transaction is finished in the terms that now the client has gold deposited under their name allocated to them packed separately uh, and now it's their own property yeah so just out of curiosity is is that so the the gold bar that million dollars in gold that, that client bought is it sitting in its own separate area is it just is it sitting in a big vault with a name tag on it how's it how, just out of curiosity how's it sitting there so there's two configurations, right? It's based on basically how much how much money client wants to uh, to spend. They can get their own dedicated uh, safe or dedicated box or you know, lockable unit, which they mm -hmm. pay for their real estate, as you call it. Um, sure. And then they pay on top of it what they call the liability charge because we're liable for loss. If there's any loss, any crime, you know, we mentioned the first episode, Tom, Tom Cruise running into the vault now. There is insurance <laughs> on that. As so sure. in case something something goes wrong and by the way most of losses are results of in, inside job it's okay. very very hmm. unlikely for someone to actually really uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know manage to go into a vault and run away it happens once in a while especially with old vaults uh, but the new yeah. vaults where they have seismographic detectors around the perimeter and cameras mm -hmm. and control center it's very very rare usually it's a bunch of Two people from the vault operator colluding, you know, right. to, yeah. to, uh, yeah. to, to grab some gold. So, so, uh, so, so it's either you. So, you anyhow, we charge liability charge. That's the basic charge, which is the insurance and the and and the audit inspection and all that. And then it's packed separately, but it's on a shelf with other clients. So, if mm -hmm. you go to yeah. vault, there'll be a big room with lots of shelf. One corner may be a. Uh, 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 Whatever UBS Bank, one corner will be a uh, um, uh, JP Morgan, one corner will be J Rothbard, one corner will be uh, another family, wealthy family. But everything is separated, but in the same room. Or if client wants to pay a bit more on the real estate, they can get their own lockable cage or unit, and then basically we open it, we dump it inside, we close it, uh, we send them the key, and then it's just locked there in the vault. But it's gotcha. important to understand there's never there's never in terms of the way we operate, there's no commingling of goods. It's very mm -hmm. even if it's on the shelf, it's still packed separately, and it's also allocated to different account numbers, and that's important because a lot of the time clients ask, "Hey, what happens if you go bust?" Right? Yeah. Well, it's not our goal. It's not on our, unlike unlike uh, a lot of companies or banks. It's not on our balance sheet. It's not like if you go bankrupt, our liquidator can say, "Hey, that's your goal." It's like, no, that's our client's goal. Why? Because it's not on our balance sheet. It's packed right. separately, and it's alloc it's allocated under different account numbers. So like, no trust me, if that was on our balance it. sheet, we wouldn't be going bankrupt. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so I, on on the other side of things, though, like if someone is selling the like, if someone's like, "Hey, uh, I think gold is high right now. I want to get out of gold, or or wh why ever they'd want to, you know." sell do you guys have to go find a buyer or, or what's that kind of look like if someone says hey i want to get i want to get rid of this it's exactly the reverse so there are two options either we buy it ourselves so because we do have we do maintain mm -hmm. some level of inventory either we buy it ourselves or we start picking the phone same thing okay we're selling today do you want to yeah. buy it who's going to buy it now how much do you yeah. want how much do you bid it and how what's it what's your ask price what's your ask, ask price and then we uh, and then we let them uh, the same thing. We we try to pick, for our point of view, is we want to give the best deal to the client. Yeah, sure. So if I can get now another supplier that buys the gold or sell, but let's say buy the gold at let's say fifteen bips below what the other company offered, we'll transfer. Usually we'll transfer it to the client. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we want we want to make sure we're competitive, and we are very competitive in terms of pricing. We need to make sure we're making money, but we need to we need to make sure the client can get it. A good deal, mm -hmm. and the larger the transaction, the better. The more, the more I would say, space we have for negotiating with the refiners and the other dealers to get a better price. So usually, if it's small items, 
or just buy them ourselves. If it's something we can afford, you know, if it's not the ten million dollars, sure. we'll we'll try to buy it ourselves. But yeah, it's the same mm-hmm. process. It's all done. It sounds tedious, but it's a matter of you know, it's a matter of an hour or a couple of hours. So hmm. again, if yeah. you're talking about misconception, this misconception that that physical gold is not liquid, but actually it's very liquid. You know, I I, I a few months ago I sold some unit trust with my HSBC here in Hong Kong, and I didn't get the money, and I was I, I was buying a property, so I wanted to. I had to transfer the money. And after like five days, I'm calling my banker like, where's the money? You're like, oh, you didn't read the fine letters. It's T plus seven. It's seven business days for settlement when you sell your unit trust in the bank. And I'm like, we, we are old school primitive gold gold dealers and we pay the same day. You know? Yeah, we're, <laughs> What's yeah, going on exactly. here? Like, sorry, yeah. sorry, did I forget to fax over something to you? I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, by and, the way, there is, I, there I guess... is uh, people are faxing. You, we, we do have a fax machine here. <laughs> you do? Wow. Oh, that's that's Hong... uh... come on, Hong Kong, get up with you it. You know why, by the way, because fa- fa- fax is still one of the uh, one of the most the in terms of privacy is one of the safest means of communication. Yeah, oh, yeah. Gold. Uh, you don't need security in gold. Nobody steals gold. No. kind of kind of i mean i know the answer is probably no but uh uh it would just be kind of a funny scenario and the whole know your client thing are are you ever doing like a little bit of a background check on someone like hey you popped a couple red flags and the person's like i swear i actually am a nigerian prince i get this all the time (laughs) (laughs) like not as yeah we we, 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 we had uh you're you're yeah yeah, that's what we call, you know, that's what we know it's called PP, politically exposed person. Okay. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. So, we, if, so if, if you're a PP, then we need to dig deeper. Like, okay, so if you're a, a, a minister in Nigeria and you claim to have $10 million to buy gold, I don't think the, the, the salary of a minister in Nigeria is that high. So maybe you can... Shed a bit yeah. more light, yeah, on. about how <laughs> how you made this ten million dollars, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so we're very uh, and, and and to be honest, you know, we're very um uh, we're quite strict in terms of, of of the KYC, and the reason is um and it is true, you know, a lot a lot of avenues can be used to to launder money or to for mm-hmm. tax evasion. Uh, gold is relatively easy pass because because we're not a financial institution. We do not need to report our clients' holdings. We do not need to. We you know we're not subject to FATCA if you're Americans. We're not. There's no common reporting sta- uh, standard if you're other jurisdictions. So, it is true that if you if you buy gold that's sitting in the vault, that money then it becomes again. If you're American, you need to declare that right as part of mm-hmm. your annual statement. But if you decide not to declare that, we, we there's no there's no there's no reporting from our side that will allow your government to be able to, to to know that. So for us it's very it's very uh where the money's coming from, making sure it's coming from from a good bank. So they don't take cash, for example. Making sure you're not someone who who pretends to be otherwise and that you're not a Nigerian prince or minister <laughs> suddenly uh and you know we had we had listen I had a guy here sitting in the office. The story didn't make sense. He came and said, Yeah when I have gold in, in in the UK, I want to bring it over. I said, fine, I need to know where you got this gold. Like, oh, why do you need to know this? I said, because you're sharing out of nowhere. You're telling me you got a lot of gold in the, in London that you need to bring, you want to move to Hong Kong. I need to know where you got it. it it's, you know, otherwise. And later on, later on, this was like recent, like last week, someone told oh, the guy, the guy was a really corrupt politician from mm-hmm. Africa. So, right, you know, not only that, we do. We are even obliged to report financial uh, uh, suspicious transactions. So if someone comes sure. to the office and say, "Yeah, you know, if he would come, and maybe that's why he was so he didn't give me his passport, he didn't, you know, he didn't tell me, he didn't give, tell me who, he, who the guy is mm-hmm. or anything," because if I would have a guy here saying, "Yeah, you know, I used to work for the, I used to be a, a prime minister in Africa, and I have this twenty million dollars worth of gold, I need to move to Hong Kong, and I don't want anyone to know about it." Our obligation is immediately to send an email to the government here saying, "Hey guys, that guy just popped in our office trying to move in this yeah, huge yeah. amount of 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 gold uh um without explaining where it's coming from so 
we are a bit picky on that because we, you know, we, we, we have a good company. We have very good clients. Everyone are, you know, are great clients, good entrepreneurs working hard for the money. The last thing you want is to bring, you know, one rotten apple to our, our, our environment. It puts everyone at sure. risk. It put me at risk. It put our business at risk. You know, it, yeah. it, it takes a long time to build reputation. One wrong move and you're out of business. So it's just yeah. not worth right. it. Well, which, yeah. which is a great, I mean, it's kind of a great segue into the actual running of the company, right? So there's the there's the handling the clients, but on the internal side, I mean, you know, obviously when you were part of a, a bigger company, there were plenty of operational things that you guys didn't really have to think about. How did that kind of, um, I mean, were, were your family members kind of a natural fit for taking on some of those like marketing or back-end office roles? Or how did you guys build a company to where you could convey that sort of confidence in your in your uh, clients and and um, climb up the ladder and become industry leaders in what you're right. doing now. So uh, first of all, because yes, family definitely helped in terms of managing the financial. Yes, my father is, is is a CPA for many years, or or my brother's director. That's kind of the the director, the, the partner can bounce ideas with. Uh, Tweek, I was not joining in the beginning yet, but one thing. I, I did decide from the beginning, I did hire an ex-colleague on a very part-time kind of hourly basis to help with all the things that are tedious but necessary in this business. That's the paperwork, getting the invoice, you know, getting the statement right, managing the inventory, all these things. I, I This is things that to begin with said, I'm going to pay even out of pocket. I'm going to pay for someone, you know, as much as they need. they need 10 hours a week, 15 hours a week, I pay them on an hourly basis to make sure all the accounting, all the inventory, everything that, that is in good order. And that, to begin with, was one thing I didn't want to do myself. The rest, yeah, customer service. So believe me, you work, you know, work 18 hours a day. You get a phone ringing uh, all the time. The upside, yeah. by the way, when you start this is that part of the time I was sitting in Israel, I was sitting in Koh and on, on, you know, on the beautiful island in Thailand, um, <laughs> and, and, uh, working from the beach, taking calls. Um, so there was no, so that's kind of the slow start, no office, sitting in, you know, relatively inexpensive jurisdiction, but paying for what's important. What was important was not the office, it was the brick and mortar. What was important is to have someone who, know, who knew what I was doing, helping me sorting out the accounting and the logistics and and on all the office so that was very important and then mm -hmm. as the volume yeah. grew up you know that person became a full-time uh, a job the next line came Vika as, as marketing it came another guy's marketing and then we start growing moving to an office and then it become more of a, of, a, of a real company with real uh, uh, responsibilities <laughs> for each person you know? so now there's ops now there's, there's accounting and now there's uh, logistics Having said that, some of the functions are still outsourced. So if you talked about marketing, the uh, uh, digital marketing, website, hosting, all this, we never did it. Our, we never did ourselves. We outsourced immediately to a company in Thailand, a, a good friend that's also an entrepreneur that's been great help in terms of bouncing ideas. And, you know, I mentioned the previous episode, who you surround yourself with, people that can do and that can encourage you and, and charge you with ideas. So great help from him on the market. He did the logo. Uh, even for free, like I want to do the logo. I want to. I want to. I'll help you building the very primitive website, the very primitive LinkedIn page. Um, so all this was um, was you know very. These are the things that we we weren't we didn't do it to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, one more thing, by the way, and I want to say because you know we you have a lot of entrepreneurs uh, listening to this. One thing I realized: if you ask people for help, if you're willing to say, "Yeah, I I need help. I need an advice." 99% of the time, people will be happy to dedicate their time, sit with you for a half, even busy people, you know, meeting with big CEOs yeah. here at the time. People say, listen, do you mind sparing half an hour? I want to talk with you about my business, how to grow, what the next step is. What I found, people are happy to give their advice. If you come and say straightforward, I need, I need help, I need an advice, could you spare half an hour? A lot of people will agree to say with well, like, sure yeah let me let me see what i can help let me introduce you to this person let me give you my advice from my experience uh, as a ceo or as an entrepreneur so advisory is one thing um 
uh, a digital marketing, all the marketing, logo, website, everything was outsourced, still outsourced. I don't want to deal with it. Even, by the way, <laughs> operating, operating <laughs> vault, you know, I, we had a discussion at the time um, whether we want to operate. It's a business model, right? To run your own vault. There are right. upsides to this. But again, that's something I very early decided coming from the vault side of things. I knew sleeping with my phone next to me at night. So if there's someone breaks into the vault or something missing, get the phone call at 1 a.m. Say, I don't, want, I don't want to deal with it. There are my previous right. employer. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. they're good at it. Let's, let's use their vaults. Yeah. Let's use their <laughs> infrastructure rather than try to reinvent the wheel and start having our, our vault and hire people. And then need to vet. Just the risk is too much. So it's a balance between what you can manage, which is ops, logistics, uh, the basic functions of accounting, uh, which you can manage internally, and the things that are just just too much of a headache, too much of a, of a, you know spending time or really expertise that you know that I, I don't need to spend time on building a website, right? I don't want to spend time right, on writing yeah. the content. I'll pay. I, I'm, I'll pay someone. It's worth my time. It's it's about knowing what's your what's your time's worth, and then saying I'm gonna write the content to the website. I'm gonna write the bullets of what I think should be there and give it to a copywriter to make, and they'll make it better, you know, in a shorter time. And it will save, it will, it will, it will free my attempt to do what I'm good at. My, I'm good at, you know, talking with potential clients, going to meetings, developing the business. I don't want to waste time on, uh, on calling. The, did the truck arrive? Did you check the gold bars? Are they there? Oh, right. Yeah. Like Which I think is such a, like, cause that is, um, uh, so a lot of entrepreneurs, right? They, they, they can be control freaks, right? And, and there's a lot of the, you know, you started on your own, and it can be kind of a tough uh, thing to develop being able to cut ties with certain parts of your business and be like, okay, not me, not me, not me, like, and start sending stuff out. So I mean, it is something that a lot of entrepreneurs need to hear is like, hey, you need to start firing yourself at certain things, right? Go ahead, fire yourself, hire someone else, you know, just do what you love doing. Like start cutting it out, right? So rationally, and I, I I agree with that. Emotionally, it's what you said earlier. It's 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 <laughs> it's really hard. I think Tvika here knows. I'm I'm a bit of a free control still. Mm-hmm. Um, I think um um, and it's funny. I mean, I can I can be now away for a week, and actually, maybe you know, approving some things or bank wires. Nobody needs me to be honest. <laughs> right, but. But I do. I still think I have. I have uh, things to offer the team in terms of knowing. Sometimes it's a matter of did you try with this supplier. It's about more of solving the problems, right? Rather than actually do the job. It's very difficult for me to say. Oh, you know, you need to. Do, you need to do it this way. I try. I try. I try not to go into this kind of uh, uh, micromanagement. It's hard, but I try not to. And try to more focus on let's let's see if I can help you find a route to solve the problem. Just because I know this guy that can help, or maybe let's try another supplier. Let's get a quotation here. Let's try to reroute this gold shipping from for this through this jurisdiction rather than this jurisdiction. So it's more of trying to provide my professional knowledge than micromanagement people. Again, it, it's uh, it's it's. Um, it's continuous work. I mm-hmm. think uh, I try to spend, but by the way, one of the things I try to spend, and that's the advantage of COVID, I try to spend less time in the office because yeah. I think the guys are doing, sometimes they're doing a better job when I'm not here. Because when I'm here, I'm always kind of alert and I'm like listening. Like, what did you just say? What is it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and when, I, when I'm working from my home office, it's like I see the results, you know, I can, I can see an email I'm not happy with and I can pick, I'll pick up the phone, but it gives them, I think, more space to, uh, to kind of uh, uh, be a bit more free in, in, in how they do their business. Again, we're trying to do that. Um, it's work in progress. It, it might sometimes come off as a little bit of an ego blow when it's like, oh, I was away for a month and wow, they got a lot more stuff done without me. Hmm. <laughs> mm, yeah, uh, I, 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 I can tell you know at this point uh, as we are growing and we want to grow more uh, for me even the next step and my, what my plan is is actually to hire a manager I want to really actively I think actively leave running the day to day 
right. and really and, and really deal on what what I can where I can contribute, which is not necessary. I don't I don't manage people very well. I know that the teams know that they feel that. <laughs> so you know it's like it's like always always trying to you know again as as much as we as a still as a young business and a smaller business can afford, but <laughs> trying to take step back. And yeah, and I can tell you, it's it's not an ego though. For me, ideally, if if the business can run, well, I we you know with all the checks and balances are in place, because again, there's a lot of issues of security, um, sure. you know, a, 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 and making sure things are we can take risks. So in terms of risk management, I want to handle the risk management, but I definitely will be happy to go back to Topania and sit there on the beach, rent a house there, sit there for a couple of years, and that that is my plan, and let the guys do their job and just. Yeah. kick in when it comes to what's important. Level of service is important for me. You know, I think we're giving top service and it's really high on my agenda. Security, of course, is high on my agenda um, and, and solutions. So I want to make sure clients are getting treated well. I want to make sure they never hear no. We can always find a way to a sort of a solution. So we had a client living in a small village in Italy, wanted to sell silver. I want to sell some gold. I'm like, how we even get to this village, and we managed to pull you and you know we managed to pull it out. We managed to uh, to get we, we found someone with a small truck with a good insurance coverage that can drive can drive to <laughs> three uh, through two countries in Europe, getting to the small village, and you know the guy was like he didn't want this big armor truck. So he didn't want his neighbors to know he's keeping gold in a little village, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, that's so awesome. all these things, I, I, I want to sit and and deal with these things, uh, right. uh, with, with this type of solution and make sure the team says, yes, we can do that. Just let us talk to Josh and, and see what's, what's the best solution is out there rather than sitting here and, 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 and you know, ranting about uh, whether they picked up the phone and say, Jay Rothbard, good morning. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so that kind of leads in, I mean, you're talking about just that scenario, but, you know, how has the industry changed over the last decade, right? I mean, gold trading and gold ownership has been around, I mean, I won't say since the beginning of time, but, you know, since, since people started doing commerce at a high level. So how has the industry changed, you know, in, in, in a way, especially over the last decade? Or has it uh, not changed? First of all, demand for... No, no I think it, it changed a lot. It changed a lot in terms that the demand from private individuals is higher than ever. Okay. So if you look at the post, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, two thousand uh, post post two thousand eight, basically, demand is much higher by private individual. Before two thousand eight, it was mostly in the West. It was Germans that were buying gold because they had this bad experience, and you know, from 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 their history. But right. now you have Eastern Europe in the game. You have the Americans buying a lot of gold. You have Australians. Uh, uh, you have um, uh, Brits buying a lot of gold. So a lot of more individuals are buying gold. And the infrastructure in terms of comp companies offering the service is much more developed. There's Singapore Freeport. There's storage facilities in Hong Kong, in, uh, in the Cayman Islands, in New Zealand, in Australia. So there's a lot of more. Co it's, it's more competitive market. It's a bigger market. Okay. It's more competitive. I think there's a lot of emphasis on the fintech side of things. A lot of companies are doing through uh, online platforms uh, and, and so on. So definitely it's changing um, in, the, in, in, in this regard. And there's more, and each company is finding their own niche. I mean, our niche is not the fintech side. We don't have, a, we don't have an online retail website. You cannot buy gold online from us. But we're more of right. like a private bank. We, we, our niche is those people Someone who's, buy, who's buying $1 million and wants it delivered to his farm in Nebraska will not be able to do it through an online platform, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Or someone who wants to sell, someone who's got inherited, and in all real cases, someone who's got just inherited, uh, 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 you know, 100 gold coins from his parents and sitting in a, somewhere in Geneva, they need someone they can trust, that can pick up the phone, can explain them how to do it, can handle it, you know, discreetly, professionally, securely with the proper insurance. So that's our niche. But some companies are doing, you know, they want to do the retail online. So I think there's more sure. fragmentation in terms of each company is now doing more of its own type of clientele. Uh, and, it's, it, and we can do that because there's just more people understand how valuable it is to have precious metal as part of your portfolio. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. 
you know, it, it's still so funny that it's such a business where you still pick up the phone and, and do transactions yeah, yeah, yeah. like that. Do you think any of that will ever change with technology at much, or will just, or do you think it, it's such a relational business that'll be that way for quite some time? I think it will. It will. It will stay this way. I know that there are a lot, there are a lot of. Uh, so again, I've been doing it for eleven years now. There are a lot of. Uh, uh, um, there were a lot of attempts to do an online solution, linking uh, buyers with sellers, uh, and helping up to the price discovery. But at the end, it's a small industry. If you put all the pressure, the, you know, the annual conference of the London Bullion Market Association, put put all of us in in one hotel for conference in a pre-COVID world. Maybe there are 500, 600 of us, you know, maybe 1,000, right. mm-hmm. not too many. So it's more about if I can buy gold, I can fix the price and commit to purchase a, a $10 million it, it, with the refineries because they trust me, not because I'm right. doing it through an online kind of yeah. mechanized. So there are some solutions. We use some of them, but it's more on this on, on a kind of a, a assistant, but it's still not the main thing. Again, not for what we do. I'm, I'm sure if you're a retail if you're, a retail, if you're a retail business, then you can do it. Things pretty much automated. Someone wants to buy one, you know, one gold eagle, uh, one silver maple. Definitely, I think there's there's advantage of being able to automate everything and do it online. But the the, the type of client we accommodate, the the volumes we tailor, it's still about you know the prices are comp- need to be competitive. Supply and the other refiners, this refinery don't want. The others to know that they ran out of gold because they sold it to JP Morgan. Mm-hmm, right. You know, because such a small market, they, they kind of try to keep it to themselves. Gotcha. So, so I, and I know that, uh, you know, because I, I know we're on a, a time limit here and I want to I want to respect your time, but this question may just open things up to like, okay, now we have to go into episode three at some point. <laughs> but do you see <laughs> yeah. the uh, cryptocurrency um, um space maybe disrupting or or changing a few things at least transactionally in your business because i i know that's you know it's cryptocurrency is in the news all the time now and everyone's going to see how this flushes out and just from your perspective do you see that as a viable like oh yeah that, that could easily change the way we do business eventually i i don't think crypto will change the way we do business uh, okay uh, cryptocurrency as an asset class i think it it, it does it take some of the attention okay uh, it, it's always been Bitcoin has been is re, being referred to often as the new goal, the new store of value, uh-huh. and I, I I spend a lot of time with crypto guys telling them actually it's not because gold has been around for four thousand years and has an in, inherent value, <laughs> and it has real use. Uh, you need gold to make jewelry. You need gold to uh, send a, 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 a spa, you know for to space send a, a, a space shuttle to space. Uh, the the, the what's the name of the sh- the the thing just went up to Mars. They have gold components. They're the real. Use for for these central banks are buying gold. You don't have it with Bitcoin, and you don't have the history. So mm-hmm. that's kind of a nutshell. And I'm happy to do a third episode on on on, on Bitcoin <laughs> versus gold. I do think though, but if you look at the technology on blockchain technology, this definitely gonna make an impact on an in, on our industry. Because right. our ability yeah. again, it's an old school business. If I'm now I'm now selling gold purchased in Switzerland uh, uh, eight years ago, right? When I'm selling it. The, the the provenance of where this gold coming from? How can I be sure it came from directly from the refinery rather than taking it and do what we do when we buy gold? We melt everything. Everything is being melted to make sure it's real. That's the only way you can hundred percent be sure gold is real. You have to melt yep. everything, recast mm-hmm. it to new bars. It takes if you know it takes four or five days. It costs some money. Instead of doing this, if we have a ledger on the mm-hmm. blockchain saying, yeah, these bars left the refinery on this day, these are the numbers. And this day they were deposited at uh, uh, Brinks Vault in Zurich. And this bo- uh, day they were shipped by um, Malka Amit to uh, uh, Singapore. And this day they were sold yep. by J. Roach. But then it makes our life easier. So sure. again, so very, I'm very confident in the blockchain technology. Uh, on the crypto side, I mean, one thing I do think crypto will help our industry is once there'll be, you know, there are a lot of talks about the gold-backed token. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so I think once there'll be a, a standard once, because now there are 100 projects. I think once, once we always stream into a few good ones, it will help right. democratize the, the gold market. Because right now, yeah, if you're, if you're a, a small-time investor and you have uh, $50, you don't have a cheap way of buying gold. Mm-hmm. 
Right. Yeah, you don't. And once we have correct. this gold back token, I think it will allow for more people on the lower end of, of the uh, consumer market. So yeah, you know, I'll buy this token that represents one gram of gold in the vault. And we do work with some of these projects. We do cooperate with them and we support them. But it, it there's still no dominant project that, that we can that's say, gonna okay, work. that's going to take yeah, off. That's really off. interesting. Well, well, when that takes off, we are definitely booking uh, episode three. So, uh, that, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. And our compliance officer will probably go nuts. But, I mean, you know. <laughs> uh, well, Mark, let's kick us into the speed round. Yes. Quick speed round. Uh, uh, four questions again. Uh, we we covered misconce or we, yeah we covered misconceptions. But what, what would you say is probably the most um, inaccurate perception of the uh, gold industry or the precious metals industry? Um, you laugh, but I think the fact that I think I think a lot of this this misconception by especially by bankers that were like a bunch of crooks trying to hide money. <laughs> <laughs> that that's like that's like the the, yeah. the most you know it's like that's like something with bank like oh you're high risk because you're high risk. I'm sitting now with a bank that has been fined fined every year two billion dollars a year for money laundering. <laughs> yeah, and you're looking at me doing like like I'm you know having <laughs> intact reputation like doing something wrong. Come on, guys. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's that that's. Point. Kind of, that's like sometimes I like oh you're you're putting money away I'm like <coughs> no we're helping people yeah. secure their wealth protect their money something that yeah. you know banks don't do anymore we we do <laughs> what banks used to do in their past you used to have gold in a safe and that's what you had they wouldn't they wouldn't be printing yeah. money and doing all this uh, 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 imaginary product right so yeah uh, right. that's a, again a whole other episode we go now so far. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, um, for you and your business and entrepreneurs in general, what is, uh, on the back office setup, what was, what was kind of that turning point where you're like, man, I'm really going to outsource this. And I'm going to keep this in house, um, on the success. What, what, what did you do there? So I think again, I think the, uh, the accounting and the ops are, are, are in-house thing. I mean, the accounting in terms of the daily accounting, not the financial reports and all that, but the yeah. ops, it's about, it's, it's about ops. And 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 what's called the RM, the relationship managers. So ops and communication with clients. It's done in house. People trust us. They want to see. They want to see us. They want to talk to us. They don't want any random person to send them an email from an outsource <laughs> center or something. Everything right. client facing. Everything client facing is is done by us. Uh, all okay. the rest that is more professional, more uh, I would say. Uh, expertise or something you need as mentioned uh account you know digital media website all this stuff can be done elsewhere but everything relates to the core talking to clients managing their gold you know follow up that this is done only in house gotcha yeah uh okay now we're getting off business and we're gonna we're gonna go with the uh, non-business related stuff so if you had a blank check or or i guess a unlimited amount of gold bars you know speaker language um, <laughs> to take a dream vacation with any celebrity or icon, dead or alive, where are you going and who are you taking? Uh, that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you... Okay. Where would I go? You'll, you'll find it probably uh, silly, but I would go to Hawaii because I haven't been and I just... Just people love it. <laughs> so I'll be just happy to go there. I've never been there. And, you know, I'm here in Asia. I have, like, everything here, but actually... Hawaii sounds perfect. All my friends have been that live there. Photos sound like an amazing place to to be. M Maui is pretty awesome. I'm not gonna lie to you. Maui is pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So that that's where yeah. I would go. Who would they go to? Um, it, it, it's it's hard to. I can tell you who I'd go to now with all the craziness going on. So I was very affected when I was a child when I read 1984 by George Orwell and then reading you know okay. Animal Farm and all. I would like, yeah. and, 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 and I read it when I was too young, so it's kind of uh, uh, had a, a, too much of a big effect on me. That's why I'm, 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 I'm totally against any, you know, uh, I'm very sensitive to freedom of speech, freedom of thought, you know, uh, limiting your freedoms is for me a, a big, you know, big red flag. I would like him to come today. I would like to take him to Hawaii and see what's going on in the world today and tell me, <laughs> and, and tell me, it's not. It's not gonna. It's not gonna get worse because I'm so pessimistic. <laughs> to be honest, 
because yeah. because of this book 1984 animal farm all his writing the way he yeah. identified what's going to happen today in the 30s of of the last century i need so either i'm going to tell him listen you're right to be pessimistic and anxious it's going to be downhill it's going to continue to be downhill <laughs> or let me have some good words of wisdom say listen as someone who saw all this crazy environment happening i think it's going to get yeah. better because i'm a bit kind of um pessimistic about where we're heading as a civilization right so yeah as society that, not so the I, answer I, I, I was yeah yeah <laughs> Not the answer I was expecting. You yeah. take George Orwell to Maui. Wow, that was not where I was <laughs> no, going to go with okay, that. Okay, okay, okay. I'll tell you, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you, and then you see how bipolar <laughs> I am. Because I, I had to think about another lighter option. Yeah. So, so get ready for that. I would go with Madonna. Oh. Well, you know, I, I, I had that one on my uh, J. Rotbart bingo. Yeah, I had Madonna yeah. instead of George Orwell, for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I love it. Something a bit more light, a what? bit more light and fun, a bit more. Um... Wait, but are you going with like 1980s Madonna or 2021 Madonna? Because she's a little, uh, you know. Uh, no, let's say, let's say uh, 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 just uh, uh, 2000. Yeah, let's say 15. Okay. 15 years ago is good enough. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> a little older, but not quite as crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Not not the well, 80s not quite kind wild. of chic. Not, not the 80s, like a virgin kind of chic. No, that's a bit too premature for me. But, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Confession, okay. conf- confessions on the dance floor, if you, if you know that. <laughs> Thank you. Go. Yes. Man, we're <laughs> all on topics. All right. Last question <laughs> before, we, before we go is, uh, if you could go and acquire one skill or talent, right? Like anything, what, what would you want it to be? Um, do something around music. Like, yeah. like play an instrument or actually my dream, which my after should sometimes try this is to, to be a conductor. Oh, oh. okay. Gotcha. Cause I like music and just, just always seeing them kind of just the, the, just the, I would say being able to produce music or to express yeah. mm-hmm. yourself by music, but also just being, you know, we talk about, uh, 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 you know, sound systems, just think about sitting in the middle of this, huge live animal yeah that that is just, true just, surround sound <laughs> true yeah absolutely. right yes. right so so do but that, would you have big it, hair though would you would you grow big hair because all good conductors have like huge long hair no i want a big stick though <laughs> <laughs> i love it yeah uh, there we go yeah there oh, is some, there is something uh ki- kind of uh incredible about music where there are some really really ugly people out there but if they're really good at music they are just, I mean, as soon as they start playing guitar or flute or whatever it is, you're like, wow, that person looks amazing. They look stoic, majestic. That's just yeah. amazing. Take away the yeah, instrument, can, they're can, a dog. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I can, t- I can tell you a, a memory I have, like, for, I don't know, when I was, like, uh, 20 or something. There was a guy, I went to this concert of this French vi- jazz violin player. Like, think of that. Uh, I think it's called Grappelli, I think his, his name was. And he was 80-something. And he was a legend, you know, I read about him, he was a legend, I went to see him. And the curtain opens, and you see a guy that cannot, actually cannot walk by himself. He, someone, he's got two kind of male nurses carrying him, and, sit, and sitting, and then they bring him the violin, and got the whole jazz band around him and everything, and they give him the, uh, the violin and, and the thing, and the guy goes crazy. For two hours, he just going crazy there, like playing, like, playing like a madman. Beautiful music, full of energy. Two two hours in a row. Then it's done. Laying last Sunday, and then the two guys come and take him out. That's a, yeah. Oh, that but, is. You know, it shows you how intense it is, and how these people, you know, and it yeah. was really like really eighty five or something. You know, you wouldn't imagine, but there's something about music I think that connects people and it gets the Good and, and allows you if, if you're listening to it kind of to forget about anything else. They can mm-hmm. be ugly, they can be old, they can be young, they can be, you know if they're if they're good at it, it's magical. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. That is something with energy. For yeah. sure. Like you kinda of talked about in the first episode, when you have good karma and good energy, it, it changes things. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So perfect. 
Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for just shedding so much light on this industry and and you know really how you guys operate as a company. Really excited to uh, 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 publish this episode. Um, real quick, everyone, uh, as always, nothing you say can or should be taken as tax, legal, or financial advice. If you are interested in in um, um, anything discussed here, uh, go talk to your CPA, go talk to your attorney. Uh, you know, give J. J Rotbart uh, and company a call. Uh, talk to your financial advisor and get good counsel before you make decisions. Um, all uh, links to everything we talked about and to uh, uh, Joshua's um, company, his his social media, his uh, YouTube is going to be in the podcast descriptions. And Josh, thank you again so much for uh, being on the show. Thanks, thanks for having me, guys. It was great. Yeah, we look forward. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to talk about that cryptocurrency and gold yes. episode because that would be a really really good episode. And by the way, one thing we didn't even talk, we didn't talk about why gold. Yeah, we didn't even get in there. Yeah. 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 I felt like we I'm seeing my like therapist, but, not, but like I'm not talking about gold. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, well, Josh, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate you being on and taking the time to do this.